There's four periods, two classes in the U.S., and then there's the administrative All Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome back to Idlewild in the Summer Forum Series. I'm Jonathan Jones, and I'm a member of the Adult Ministry Committee. And uh, today, we, uh, in just a moment, I'll call up a guest, introduce her to introduce our, our speaker today. But uh, as is our uh, norm, what I'd like to do is open us in prayer, and then I will hand the reins over. Ooh. Hello. Can we silence phones? <laughs> All right. Let us pray. Oh God, thank you for bringing us together. And thank you for the fellowship of this church as we begin to open our hearts and minds and take in much needed knowledge, just as our parched earth is taking in some much needed rain, and we will be patient with the weather because of that. But we thank you for all of your gifts. We thank you for your gracious love that you have bestowed on us in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died so that we may live forever. And now may the words of our mouths Meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our Redeemer. Amen. 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 Uh, normally, I would now take off with an introduction, but yesterday I got a lovely text out of the blue. And Beth Simpson is an old friend of our guest today. So, I'm going to step aside and let Beth introduce him. And thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy it. I, I said to Jonathan, I can't believe I'm being so presumptuous, but <laughs> into this I speak it tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Jonathan could tell you uh, of his, uh, their partnership as history teachers at NUS, their friendship, that he could tell you what an amazing teacher Jonathan is, that he's won the Outstanding Teacher Award two times, once awarded by the faculty, once by the students. He could tell you all those things, but I wanted to tell you about his heart, his servant heart. Some of you already know that, but um, 10 years or more ago, my grandson Edward was one of his students, and he was, I was always hearing about Mr. Large this, Mr. Large that. Grandma really liked Mr. Large. And so I was thrilled when he started volunteering at Mormon Meal, and I had a chance to know Mr. Large and to see that servant heart. One of his students is here, Jonathan's son Paul. And every Thursday night, there are four or five of his students who come with him to help with more than a meal. There's no end to the kinds of things that Jonathan does. He delivers meals, he's out here do with the food truck. Uh, he knows, I guess, you hear him say, Anthony, my man, or Anthony, my brother. He knows them and he cares and they know that. And the most important thing is that these students at NUS are having a chance to see that kind of service in action. They see it lived out and that's such an important part of the shaping of their lives. And so if you don't know Jonathan, you have a treat in store. I tell him all the time the only problem is if you just weren't so quiet <laughs> and so shy and so unenthusiastic. <laughs> 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 
I think I'm supposed to put on a microphone even though I'm very loud. But actually before I do that, I'm, I'm not a computer kind of guy, but I brought some visual aids. So we've got the narrative history here. We've got five of the six novels. I couldn't find Shallow. And then I've got the letters from Walker Percy to Shelby Foote, which we'll talk about. Then I've got a book with his signature in it. And I'm gonna give you this map. He drew all of the maps in the narrative history by hand. And I just want you to get a, get a sense of his very distinctive handwriting. No, let me do it for you. Okay, okay thank you, perfect. His wife can't see you. <laughs> His handwriting is pretty distinctive, but of course, to me, the most distinctive thing about him and my introduction to Shelby Foote was through the voice. I'd never heard a voice like that before. And like probably most people in America, I first got to know Shelby Foote through Ken Burns' documentary series in 1990, the summer of 1990, when it aired on PBS. For the first time, I was 10 years old. I'm sure I was doing something inconsequential in the corner of the living room. And my dad, who had read the narrative history, had the TV turned on and was watching the uh, first episode. And I heard that voice and I thought, I have never heard anything like that in my entire life. It was just unbelievable. The cadence of it, the rhythm. I grew up in Memphis. My mom's from Clarksdale. I never heard anything like that before, ever, ever, ever. And I was just captivated by it. And then when my dad said, oh, yes, he lives a couple of blocks away on East Parkway, I went, what? <laughs> this, you know, platonic voice is emanating from two blocks away on East Parkway. I just couldn't believe it. And I watched the rest of the series with him. I wish that I could report that I immediately at 11 years old read the series. And that's actually not what happened. So Shelby Foote entered my life when I was 10 years old. And then we kind of took a break of about eight or nine years. And then when I was in college, a friend gave me this book which is uh, the collected letters of Shelby Foote and his childhood best friend, Walker Percy. And I read this in college and that just completely changed my life. Everybody I knew, everybody who was around me, you know, talked about the normal things, politics, sports, what other people were doing, but these were very serious conversations centered almost exclusively around the life of the mind. And Foote in particular was just so authoritative in these pronouncements that he would make. He would, he would write to, to Percy and say something like, well, when it comes to writing, you have Shakespeare, and then there are various other people. <laughs> when it comes to music, there's Mozart, and then there are various other people. Or he would kind of take down people that I liked. He'd say Flannery O'Connor was a minor, minor writer, <laughs> or that Thomas Wolfe was uh, superficial and not worth a grown man's uh, time. It's this kind of business. I thought, well, where does he come off doing that? And then I'd read more and think, well, he's read all of this stuff. And just the way they were always talking about books and philosophy and, and music just completely intrigued me. And that's when I decided that I would read the narrative, which I did in the summer after my sophomore year of college. and was just completely captivated by that. And then went into reading the novels as well. So it's been an incredible influence on my life. Just the idea that, uh, as he said, reading and writing is something that's so serious and worth a grown man's uh, time. And of course, the fact that he lived most of his life in Memphis was an important thing for me also. He wasn't born here, though. Foote was born in 1916 in Greenville, Mississippi. Had a very sort of interesting background. His father was the son of a wealthy plantation owner. His mother was actually Jewish, which wasn't all that uncommon in the Mississippi Delta and in Greenville. Her father, Shelby Foote's grandfather, had immigrated from Vienna to the United States when he was 17 years old. 
and Foote said he never understood how he got to Mississippi. You know, made it to New York, how you ended up in Greenville, Mississippi, he never had any idea, uh, but he did, and he became pretty successful as a farmer and a merchant. Foote's father was, uh, as the son of a well-to-do plantation owner, not really planning on doing much with his life, didn't go to college or anything like that, but uh, when he got married, his father sort of gambled everything away so uh, his father-in-law, Foote's Jewish grandfather, got him a job with Armour and Company. And right about when Shelby was born in 1916, his father's career took off. They moved all over the South. They lived in Jackson. They lived in Vicksburg. They ended up in Mobile. But then when he was six years old, his father suddenly died. So if his father had lived, you know, he was climbing up that corporate ladder. They would have ended up likely in Chicago, where he would not have had a Southern point of view at all, having grown up in the suburbs of Chicago, but that's not what happened. So at six, he and his mother moved back to Greenville, where he spent the rest of his childhood, went to the public school there. He said he read kind of the normal stuff kids read, Tarzan and that sort of thing, uh, the Hardy Boys, but the sort of key moment for him came when he was 12, when for whatever reason, not having to do with school or anything else, he picked up a copy of David Copperfield. And he said Dickens just completely changed his life. He realized, uh, oh, this is a world that's in some ways more real than the real world, and this is what art can do. And he just became interested in words in the English language. He always insisted that when he uh, read, he never saw, and when he wrote, he never saw pictures in his mind or images. It was always the words, the commas, the semicolon. It was a very literary thing for him, both reading and writing. Then a couple of years later, another event that would shape the rest of his life, uh, an elderly or middle-aged bachelor in uh, town in Greenville, a lawyer named William Alexander Percy, had three cousins from Birmingham come to live with him. Those three young men had lost both of their parents within a year, so they moved to Greenville from Birmingham, and William Alexander Percy uh, approached Shelby Foote and said, I've got these uh, cousins who are coming to stay with me. They're about your age will you befriend them and he said sure and that was the beginning of a lifelong friendship with walker percy who ended up as a novelist and foot said he would spend as much time at the percy house as he did at his, as his, at his own house after that and he said william alexander really shaped their lives in addition to being a lawyer he had been a world traveler a poet served in world war one and was just extremely interested in reading and writing and that sort of thing, and so shaped both Walker and Shelby in his recommendations. For example, uh, when Shelby was 17 or so, William Alexander Percy said to him that the three greatest books so far in the 20th century, and this was about 1930, 31, he said the three greatest books so far are Proust's Remembrance of Things Past, Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain, and Joyce's Ulysses. So at 17 years old, Foote got all three of those <laughs> multi-volume books and set to work and just absolutely loved it. And in fact, he would always consider Proust his favorite book. He said every time he did something he thought was worthy of a treat, he would stop and read all of Proust, take a month or two to read all of Remembrance of Things Past, which I've tried to do and can't do, but <laughs> I gave it my best. Uh, he said growing up in Greenville in a lot of ways was very isolating other than the Percy household. It wasn't a literary uh, uh, area. There wasn't a whole lot of reading. Uh, he said the town library was pretty terrible. <laughs> Just a lot of uh, contemporary bestsellers. So he would borrow books from the Percys, but he'd also order books from catalogs. It wasn't a bookstore in the town. And um, he said from the time that he was 16 or so to the time that he was 22, yeah, he just spent eight, nine hours a day reading, sitting on the front porch, just sort of absorbed in that. In school, he was a bit of an anti-establishment person. He edited the school newspaper. He didn't like to conform to policies that didn't make sense to him. 
And so he was very critical of the principal publicly and in print. That got him in a lot of trouble. He actually got expelled from the Greenville High School a couple of times, and reluctantly the principal let him back in. Uh, when he graduated, he decided he wanted to go to his school at North Carolina Chapel Hill. That was mostly because of Mr. Will, William Alexander Percy, who greatly admired the president of Chapel Hill at the time, Frank Graham, saw him as kind of a liberal reformer and an intellectual. So he insisted that Walker Percy go up to Chapel Hill and Shelby Foote wanted to follow him. But when he applied, and of North Carolina wrote to Greenville High School for the records, the principal wrote back uh, and said, by no means accept this dreadful person to your school. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, he got denied actually, but he decided he would go anyway. So he drove up there on matriculation day and he entered the gym and they looked at the records and they said, we told you not to come here. And he said, well, I didn't believe you meant it. <laughs> they, said, <laughs> they said, well, since you're here, might as well stay. So he did, uh, they let him in. But uh, that anti-establishment streak pretty quickly shined through there too. He didn't go to classes that he wasn't interested in. He went to classes he wasn't enrolled in, including graduate classes. I uh, loved to read. He said he'd never seen anything like the non-story library at Chapel Hill. He was like a colt in clover. He'd just go in there every day and read. And he stayed for two years until finally they told him he had failed out because he didn't go to any of the classes that he wasn't interested in. There's a, he told a great story that I liked as a teacher. He said he had a class that second year he was up at Chapel Hill. He really liked the professor. It was an uh, English literature class and they read one book a week. It was a British literature class and they read one book a week. And when they got to Sir Walter Scott, Quentin Durward, he said, this book is terrible. So he went and saw the professor and said, look, I can't read this book. It's really awful. I just can't get into it. Uh, do you mind if I just don't read this book? And the professor said, you know what? I think that's a completely <coughs> smart decision. You go ahead and do it. So when it came time for the test, they took a test the week he wrote on the paper. I did not read this book with your permission, turned it in. The next week got it back as an F. And he went back to the professor and said, you told me I didn't have to read the book. He said, absolutely, I told you it was smart, but you gotta take the consequences of what you do. <laughs> so, <laughs> he said that was a pretty good uh, lesson that he learned at Chapel Hill. So once uh, he finished up school there, he said he never really intended to get a degree anyway. He headed back to Greenville, took a job uh, as a reporter on the newspaper there. And then the next year, 1939, with the war clouds looming, he joined the Mississippi National Guard and he started working on his first novel. He decided that that was uh, gonna be what he did. That was gonna be the focus of his life. Uh, they got uh, absorbed into the regular army in 1940. He ended up becoming a captain, went through all the training in the United States, got sent to Ireland where they were waiting on D-Day and mobilization. He met uh, and fell in love with an Irish girl who lived in Belfast. They were in Northern Ireland. The problem was that her house in Belfast was 52 miles from the army base and you were only allowed to go 50 miles on personal visits. So he would, and he said this was a common practice. He falsified the trip logs. So it was 49 miles instead of 52 miles. Uh, his anti-establishment uh, posture got him in trouble with the colonel who laid a trap with them, busted him, and boom, dishonorable discharge from the army. So never saw combat. Came back to America, signed up with the Marines, went to boot camp. They said, okay, army captain, Marine private, perfect. This is, <laughs> this is exactly how it should be. Uh, but. Uh, the bombs dropped before he could get over to the Pacific, and so uh, he was mustered out honorably this time, but never saw any uh, 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 service, any combat, which people who read these uh, histories find that kind of hard to believe, <laughs> but he said he learned a lot from being in the Army, at least about bureaucracy, so uh, that that helped him in the future. He went back to Greenville. He actually married that uh, young lady from Ireland, 
she came over to Mississippi for three months, said, I'm not doing this anymore, and they divorced. And so she went back to Ireland. Three months of Mississippi was enough uh, for her. But, so he settled down in Greenville uh, and uh, submitted this, his first novel called Tournament, which is sort of a pioneer novel about a fictionalized version of his grandfather coming to the Delta and fighting Panthers and setting up a plantation and that kind of thing. And he sent it up to Random House, to Bennett Surf, which were the publishers of William Alexander Percy's uh, books. And they wrote back and said, you know, if we like your book, but if we publish this book, uh, booksellers would hate you <laughs> because it's too weird and nobody would ever buy it and it would kind of crash your reputation. So they said, put it away in a drawer, write a second novel, and then come back to that. And so that's what he spent 1946, 47, 48 doing, kind of uh, tightening up Tournament, the first novel, and then working on Shiloh, which was his second novel, which was about the battle and mostly historical, but he introduced some fictional characters to it. While that was going on, he also sent a story, a short story he had written to the Saturday Evening Post. They accepted it, published it, paid it $750. Uh, he took the money, bought a leather jacket, a shotgun, and a desk lamp, which he kept for the rest of his life, all three of those things, and quit his job, got really excited, wrote a second, a longer uh, short story for the Saturday Evening Post. They accepted it, paid him $1,200. Then he wrote a third, even longer story, and they wrote him back and said, we don't publish stories about incest. And so that was the end of his relationship with the Saturday Evening Post. Wow. He got tournament published in 1949. Shiloh was published the next year, 1950. And then he really dove into creating a fictionalized world based on one of his role models, who was uh, William Faulkner. The way Faulkner had built the world out of Lafayette County in Oxford, Mississippi, and called the Yonkin and Patalfa. Foote did that with uh, Greenville and Washington County. Uh, he called this fictional county Jordan County, made the town seat Bristol, which was in the northern part of the county, and he made a sort of village in the south called Ithaca. But he was also up to something maybe a little more than Faulkner, because not only was Jordan County in his fictional world sort of a representative uh, of Washington County, Mississippi, but he also saw it as a microcosm of the whole nation. So the capital was on a river, the northern half of the county was industrial, the southern agricultural. You know, Bristol draws its name from the city of English commerce, Ithaca's more classical in the south. Uh, he always had high ambitions for himself. He met Faulkner when he was about 19, he and Walker Percy were driving up from Greenville to Swanee, where William, Uncle Will, William Alexander, had a house and had gone to school. And as they drove through Oxford, Foote said, I'm gonna stop here and uh, we'll meet Mr. Faulkner. And uh, Walker Percy, being well brought up, said, no, we're not gonna inflict ourselves on this stranger. And Foote said, it's fine. So Percy stayed in the car, Faulkner answered the door, Shelby Foote said, Mr. Faulkner, I'm going to be a writer, and I think I'm going to be a better writer than you are. <laughs> because a writer is the sum of his influences. Your influences are Joseph Conrad and Sherwood Anderson. Mine are you and Proust. And mine be yours. <laughs> so, uh, despite that kind of crazy introduction, Faulkner took an interest in Foote. Uh, and uh, helped to mentor him. So Foot said, you know what, I can start doing what you did, have this fictional world, but I can go even farther with it. I can make it sort of just a, a microcosm of the whole United States. So he ended up writing a series of four additional novels. All of them are about, a, all five of these novels are about 100,000 pages. They're all set in this uh, rural uh, uh, count, 100,000 words, <laughs> not pages, 100,000 words. They're all set in this rural, uh, fictional Mississippi County, Jordan County. One of them is about a, Follow Me Down is about a, a murder trial. One of them is about sort of a love relationship. One of them goes back through the history of the uh, county. 
And so by 1953, he thought he had a nice little set of these books and he was looking for something new. He had written these five novels. When Random House wrote him back and they said, look, we're thinking about having this series of 200,000 word books on the great American conflict. So we want you to start, write a 200,000 word book on the Civil War, then we'll have someone do a one on the revolution, We'll have someone do one on the War of 1812. There'll be these kind of literary takes on it. So Foot said, sure, he signed the contract, spent about a week or two looking everything over, and he decided, I can't do that. Uh, you know, I can't do a short 200,000 word book on the Civil War. This is a lot more intense than that. So he wrote back to Random House and said, how about a million words? And he said they waited two weeks. He didn't hear anything. He doesn't know what they said. But finally they came back and said, okay. And so he began. He ended up with a million and a half words. He thought it would take him six years maybe. It took him 20. When someone asked him why it took him five times as long to write it as it took to fight it, <laughs> he said, well, there were five million of them and one of me. <laughs> But for sure, he uh, said that if he had known it was going to take 20 years, he didn't think he would have done it. But it, I don't think he regretted it. He just said he had no idea what he was getting into. Uh, he moved up to Memphis. He had been in Greenville up to that point. He had married again, gotten divorced again. And so moved up to Memphis in 1955 to start writing the Civil War Trilogy. Initially he moved downtown, kind of near the Ornamental Metal Museum on Arkansas Street. Ended up two years later getting married uh, to Gwen Rayner, who was the wife of Dr. Shea, or she left Dr. Shea for Shelby Foote, and that actually worked out. They were married the rest of their lives, so that third marriage uh, stuck. He wrote the first volume of the history down on uh, uh, Arkansas Street downtown, Moved to the suburbs to Yates uh, 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 Avenue uh, for the, the second book and then settled down where probably most of you know that he lived on East Parkway uh, for the third book and for the rest of his life. Uh, to fund the writing, he got a Guggenheim Fellowship, which let him buy the books and travel all over the country to the battlefields. He didn't do primary source research. He didn't go into libraries. He didn't read letters. Uh, he based almost everything he read off of published books. He said about 400 books that form the basis of his research. Uh, the bulk of it being that uh, official records of the War of the Rebellion, which was produced by the national government in the years after the Civil War. He always tried to visit battlefields on the anniversary of the battle. Uh, because that way you get to know uh, the exact feel of the land. You know, Shiloh on April the 6th, which is when it was fought, it's going to be pretty different uh, than Shiloh in November. And that was another awesome story. When he was still living in Greenville before he moved to Memphis, he was heading up uh, for the 90th anniversary of the battle. So April 6, 1952, it was a Sunday morning. And he just, you know, decided he would stop and see if Mr. Faulkner wanted to go with him. So about 8.30 in the morning, he knocked on Faulkner's door, said, would you like to go to Shiloh with me? It's the 90th anniversary of the battle. Faulkner said, sure. Got dressed. They got in the car. They get to Corinth, and Faulkner said, son, I'm going to need a drink. And Shelby Foote said, well, Mr. Faulkner, it's Mississippi and 9.30 a.m. on a Sunday. <laughs> and he said, well, you pull into the town square, and they did, and they parked in front of the hotel. He said, there's a young man inside the lobby of the hotel getting his shoes shined. And Faulkner said, go ask that young man for a drink. And Foote said, well, he's dressed up. He's probably going to church. He said, go ask him where we can get whiskey. <laughs> and so Foote went in and said, I'm sorry, do you know where we could get whiskey? And the gentleman said, well, I'm just headed out that way myself. If you'll give me a ride. <laughs> so got in the car, went out to the bootlegger, got the whiskey, headed on down the road. And Foote said, well, Mr. Faulkner, how did you know he would know where the whiskey was? And Faulkner said, anybody with clothes cut like that isn't going to church. <laughs> so uh, Foote always told that as Faulkner being an excellent judge of uh, character. 
So they ended out going over the battlefield. He said uh, that Faulkner was a pretty quick study and uh, understood what had happened uh, at Shiloh pretty quickly. Foote always said that his approach to writing the history was very similar to writing the novels, that it's basically the same thing. In one case, you make up the facts. In another case, you get them out of a book. But you always have to stay true to the facts and uh, find a way to present them in the best way. That's what truth is. He believed he loved to quote Keats. A fact isn't a truth until you love it. He said facts aren't truth. Just presenting things that happen, that's not what the truth is. The truth is making them beautiful and making them fit and plot and all of that sort of thing. So he said, you know, it's almost exactly the same. The only difference is I could never make anybody up like Lincoln or Bedford Forrest. <laughs> he said, you can't write a novel like that because you just don't have the imagination to create these people which I think is uh, true. He followed Hemingway's advice that you need to know everything you can about what you write, but you don't put most of it into the story. Uh, Hemingway had the iceberg theory where maybe the actual novel is 10% is what's above the surface and 90% is below the surface. Uh, he said, Hemingway said that when he wrote The Old Man in the Sea, he knew everything about the mating habits of Morlands. But you didn't put anything that in the novel. But you just have to know all of that stuff. And Foote said it was the same way he said when he wrote The Civil War. He said it was absolutely essential to me that I knew how Lincoln walked when he walked across the room. That I knew that though he was 6'4", almost all of his height was in his legs. When he sat down in a chair, he was the same height as everybody else. His knees were way up above his waist, and his law partner said if you put a marble on his knee, it would just roll down into his lap when he was seated. He said, I never put that in there, and maybe that didn't help you understand the Gettysburg Address, but it does help you understand Lincoln. And for Foote, whether it's fiction or history, it's the character that drives absolutely everything. Character is destiny. He said bad writers start out, whether history or novelists, bad writers start out saying, what about a situation in which a person does this or people do that? He said good writers start out, what about a person who gets in a situation who does this or who does that? And so that was true uh, for writing the, the histories as well as for writing the uh, novels. When he started out, he bought the most expensive bottle of wine he could find, champagne, held on to it for 20 years. Uh, after he finished the third volume, had a big dinner party for all his friends. Walker Percy came up from New Orleans. Uh, everybody signed the, the bottle of wine, and it became a lamp. He turned it into a lamp, and now it's over at Rhodes College, which you can go look at it, which is pretty uh, cool. When he finished that 20-year, uh, three-volume, hefty set of the history, he tried his hand at one more novel, which was set in Memphis, so departed from his fictional world called September, September. That came out in 1978. And then he never really wrote anything again, certainly not for publication. He tried. He kept up his routine, which was incredibly strict. He started writing every day at 8.30 in the morning. He kept banker's hours, 30 minutes for lunch. He was done at 4.30. He wrote by dip pen because he said he didn't want anything mechanical in between him and the page, not even a fountain pen. He had to order his nibs from New York and he kept a huge box of them after everybody stopped uh, making them. When he would finish a novel, he had them bound, the handwritten manuscripts bound in these medieval leather copies, which are over at Rhodes. But he said the, the Civil War was too much, and so he used it for, for fire kindling, because it was, <laughs> there was just too uh, uh, much of it. Um, he said if he took a day off, it took him two or three days to get back in gear and back up to steam. So he tried to write seven hours a day. Uh, eight hours a day, do his kind of research and reading in the night. Every now and then he would stop and read Proust again for the seventh time or the eighth time, or he would read Dante or Chaucer or something to reward himself and get back into it. 
but he never was able to put anything together uh, for the last two decades of his life. But I think that was okay. He ended up with six novels and the uh, history. So that's what I've got. Any questions? You've got a lot. Talk about Percy. Well, it's very interesting because, you know, Shelby Foote's writing was much more traditional than Percy's, much more rooted. Foote said everything for him was rooted in conversation. And growing up in the South in the teens and 20s, he said everything was rooted in the King James Bible. So those rhythms and cadences in his writing I think are much more in tune with what we would think of as a Southern style, a sort of rhetoric and oratory than, uh, than Percy. Percy went to UNC, he went to class, unlike Shelby Foote, so he got his degree, went up to Columbia and went to medical school. And then when he was an intern, he wasn't being careful in doing uh, these dissections of cadavers, and he got tuberculosis. And so he ended up, Walker Percy did, having to go to a sanatorium for three years, came back out of that and didn't want to be a, a doctor anymore, came back to Greenville and decided to write. Uh, it's interesting, Percy always saved Foote's letters, but Foote didn't save Percy's letters until after his first novel got published. <laughs> so the first like third of this correspondence is you get in the one-way conversation because <laughs> it's all Shelby Foote to Walker Percy and it's a lot of advice. But uh, Percy converted after that TV experience. He converted to Catholicism. He grew up Presbyterian, but he said it was very drab and boring and uh, <laughs> didn't fill any deep needs. So he converted to Catholicism and became incredibly dedicated to you know, his vision of the good, which was rooted in uh, God. But his writing is very, you've read it, right? It's very different. It's not traditional at all. It's kind of modern and confusing and almost in some ways uh, just more detached from the South and about the South than Foote. In fact, in an interview with Foote, one of the interviewers uh, quotes something Percy had said, which Percy said, you can be sure my writing doesn't come from sitting around on the porch with iced tea listening to old men talk about the Civil War. And Foote said, yeah, it did. He said, I was on the porches with them. He just had kind of a different uh, attitude about it. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's interesting because Foote was not religious at all. You know, Mother was Jewish, he was baptized Episcopalian, which is what his father was. Every now and then he'd go to a church, but he just didn't have any kind of religious life at all. But his work is so much more rooted in the Bible than, than Percy's. He was a, a real deal believer. And Percy ended up writing six novels also, and then um, died first. He died, Percy died in 1989 of prostate cancer. Uh, in 2001, Foote died in 2005. In 2001, uh, C-SPAN came down and did a three-hour interview with Foote at his house on North Parkway, and this is a great, uh, uh, on East Parkway, and this is a great moment. The interviewer looks around, he's got about 8,000 books in the house, and he says, what's your favorite book? And at first, Foote says, well, they're all my favorite. But then he says, well, come over here, take some of the book he says, this is the New York edition of Henry James. He's got all the books lined up. And he said that was Walker's favorite possession. And he said over here is this Oxford edition of Shakespeare. He said that was my favorite possession. And so we got in a bet. Whichever one of us died first would give the other his favorite possession. As you can see, I won the contest. <laughs> 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 Yes, sir. Uh, John, first of all, John, John, thank you for being here, and especially thank you for being you. <laughs> but uh, why don't you speak to Shelby Foote's view on Ethan Bedford Forrest? Yeah, he, he, uh, he saw Forrest as just the most brilliant person on the Confederate side, no question about it. 
He got to know a little bit for his granddaughter. He met her in Memphis in the 50s at a party. And he said to her, I've thought long and hard about these things. And I've come to the conclusion that there were two authentic geniuses in the Civil War, your grandfather Bedford Forrest and Abraham Lincoln. She said, sir, we've never thought very highly of Abraham Lincoln and his family. <laughs> and she turned around and walked off and was insulted by uh, the coupling. But he stuck with that. You know, Forrest had no education at all, no military background, and he said this is just the most brilliant commander by far on the southern side. Um, he never really got much into you know, the sort of ethical or moral dimensions of forest life, particularly the Klan and after the uh, Civil War. Every now and then, when someone would want to take down the statue, people, someone from the commercial appeal would come over and ask him a question, and he'd say, basically, you know, that's history, let's leave it alone. But he did, I mean, he was convinced that Forrest was just an absolute genius. I don't, you know, it's interesting because he said, Foote said in an interview that he ended up really enjoying the scoundrels because they just made his life a lot more interesting and they made the book a lot more interesting. So he said that he just really got bored with Robert E. Lee <laughs> for whatever reason and never got bored with uh, Edwin Stanton, who was Lincoln's Secretary of War, he just that he's an awful scoundrel, but he was so much fun. So, you know, I think you're not necessarily having, you know, making a character judgment on these people. But, I mean, at the same time, for sure, that's, if anything, that is, things like that would get foot in uh, maybe a little bit of a trouble, trouble these days. Percy said, after the third volume of the history got published, he said uh, that he thought the ending, the last chapter focuses on Jefferson Davis. He said he thought that was a mistake. But he said before that, you would have no idea whether someone was from Ohio or Mississippi who wrote this, right? And you might even think based on the sympathetic treatment of Sherman that it's somebody from Ohio. But he said at the end, you kind of focus on Jefferson Davis and that's, you know, that kind of spoils it a little bit. And Foote said, well, you don't understand really what I'm doing because what Foote loved to do was to take these different perspectives. You know, it was something in his narrative. It was something that Robert Browning, who was his favorite Victorian poet, did with The Ring in the Book. Faulkner did it with As I Lay Dying, where you just, you have seven or eight different narrators. And so you kind of view it from that way. He doesn't have different narrators in here, but he's always jumping from perspective to perspective. So he started out at the beginning of the first volume with Lincoln, and he ended the last volume with Davis, and he thought it made sense artistically. Um, Percy didn't agree. But I think it, it's, it's, it's not by any means sort of a uh, Southern worshiping thing. He took pains uh, in a couple of the prefaces to say, you know, as he was writing in the 50s and 60s, one in particular where he says, you know, looking at Orville Falbess, who was the governor of Arkansas, and George Wallace and Ross Barnett, who was the governor of Mississippi, uh, made me realize what was worse than this whole Confederacy thing. You know? So um, he was always in favor of the civil rights movement. He got tired of Memphis in the early 60s and uh, was seriously working on moving down to Gulf Shores in 1964 had an architect draw up plans for a house but uh, got in trouble with the Klan down there because he was riding around with a Lyndon Johnson sticker on the back of his car in 1964 <laughs> which they didn't like and then when they confront him he'd say you're the scum of the earth and you know you're not even anything you know, confederates would be ashamed of you and all this kind of business so they gave him death threats and he stayed in Memphis but <laughs> that's quite a change from the, the sex symbol he became uh, he told me that and Huggy Huggy's a couple of years old yes. son uh, he became these women would literally you you can tell this I mean he just became the sex symbol after that TV show aired and these women would send him stuff and call him and get his number and it was just it's pretty funny how you go from that right but I, I think he was okay with that because of what it did to sales 
They were selling, <laughs> he was selling throughout the 70s and early 80s, he said pretty steadily about 4,000 copies a year of the trilogy. Mm -hmm. And then after the Ken Burns, they were selling 50,000. Oh my God. Have you talked to Happy Uh A couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So, How yes, ma'am. A lot. <laughs> I mean, a lot more than you would think based on, you know, because he said before, so the last volume, it took five years for the first, five years for the second, ten for the third. Is so basically 54 to 74. They paid him along the way. He got those two Guggenheim fellowships early. He got a Ford Foundation fellowship in the middle. Again, mostly to help with travel and uh, buying books and that kind of thing. So finished the third volume in 1974, and so that's 15 years till Ken Burns, before the Ken Burns series, and he said, basically the only people who were buying it before then were libraries, a few colleges, and sort of just your buffs, your hardcore school. Mm -mm. He got a little bit, I mean, a little bit of royalties off of the, off of the five novels, but, you know, it was kind of hand to mouth, but the Ken Burns, that changed all that. So, <laughs> which he didn't mean. Ken Burns had no idea that this was going to happen. Talk, oh, maybe this is the captain, because that's obviously what changed that. Ken Burns asked Robert Penn Warren to do it. He was up in Connecticut at Yale, and Robert Penn Warren said, I'm not going to do that, but there's this guy you need to talk to in Memphis. His name's Shelby Foote. Ken Burns had never heard him, so he flew down, came over here to the house on East Parkway, he did two hours of interviews, flew back to New York, looked at the interview, got back on a plane immediately <laughs> and flew back to Memphis. <laughs> and just was here for days. And if you uh, have seen it, you'll know, I mean, Foot really carries it, just completely. So I think that kind of, people just fell in love, men and women, I mean, just that was just completely captivated. He's just sitting on the couch in front of his book chair, and book, bookcase, but it's just, Blew everybody away. It's a great chapter in Confederates in the Attic. Yes. Where Tony Horowitz goes and meets Shelby Foote at his house and, you know, the phone rings, no, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> you know, so. Um, yeah, he never said. I don't know what year that book was published. In the, a little later, but okay. yeah. Uh, he never signed books for strangers. It's funny, he would have this kind of reticent public persona, but he's the guy who bothered Faulkner, right? You know, he showed up at Faulkner's house. <laughs> you know, but like, he, he said, if I signed your book, then that would cheapen it for my friends. So he never would do that. Uh, he said, as minor of a literary person as I am, the phone is always, he said, you know, the people are always sending you manuscripts to read, the phone is always ringing, and so you just have to be very careful about uh, what you say yes to because you need time for reading, so. What's the status of his archives? So, when he was alive, he gave a bunch of stuff to North Carolina, which is where Walker Percy's, um, uh, all his stuff is, so the letters between Percy and Foote are all up there. It was really cool for me to see that. I've been up there uh, maybe three times in the last 10 years. And so I've read this many times, but you just don't get a sense like the when Tournament got published, which was the first novel, he wrote the letter to Percy on the dust jacket of the novel to be like, look what I just did. You know, so that was uh, pretty cool. Um, but, uh, when he died, uh, and then after his wife died, uh, Huggy shopped what was left around, and North Carolina just couldn't pay for it. So a lot of stuff is at Rhodes, a lot of really cool stuff. The medieval band binding, leather binding of those five novels is at Rhodes. Um, his sort of daily diary is at Rhodes, and that cool lamp <laughs> is at Rhodes. Uh, so there are people over there who are doing some work on it. Huggy's mostly moved back here, I think, and is working with it. So I don't know what's going to end up, but it's a split collection. Some at North Carolina, some at Rose. Yes, sir. Looking at that archive, have you learned some things about Shelby Foote that otherwise would not have emerged out of a typical history? And I wonder what those things might be. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of minor things. He uh, loved to watch As the World Turns. <laughs> 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 but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't think we're offhand, but yes, I mean, certainly archival research, which he did not do, Shelby Foote would never do, I think is fascinating because you do miss a lot of things just about the rhythm of their daily life. So it's cool. And the handwriting, anytime you get to see the handwriting, it's as distinctive as the voice. It's awesome. Yes, ma'am. I was curious, you said that um, when he was doing the research for the Civil War trilogies that he um, didn't do like primary source mm -hmm. research. Why was that? He just didn't want to go into archives. I mean, he did, in the official records of the rebellion, you have primary sources, but he didn't do he didn't do anything that wasn't published because he just didn't want to. <laughs> I mean, just, Does that make him less? I mean, clearly, it didn't make him less credible. But how do other historians view that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you know he had a sort of a love hate relationship uh, with professional historians who he thought wrote terribly, and he also thought that the focus on broad changes that you get in professional history really obscured the fact that it was people who made decisions. So he thought everything need, that's why he went with the narrative history, everything needed to be rooted in people. Uh, he made fun of books about the Civil War that would have a chapter on the cotton trade, a chapter on what Congress did, a chapter on Lincoln, a chapter on the actual fighting cult when the armies meet. He just thought that approach wasn't helping you get to the truth of people. It was always people and their relationships. So that's why he's got this very narrative-centered focus. If you know the price of grain, it's not going to help you unless you know what it made Lincoln do. And so that's, so that I think in the lack of footnotes, uh, you know, there's no, he doesn't tell you where anything came from. <laughs> so that um, might cause people some <laughs> doubts. He said that he would stand for anything he wrote. He never made anything up in the narratives, just like in the uh, novels, he was true to his facts. He made the facts up in the novels, got them out of the books and the narratives. But there are a couple, there's one story in particular about Forrest that Tim Hubner at Rhodes doesn't believe. And it's about the retreat from Shiloh. It's just this incredible story that Forrest was guarding the, re, he's the rear guard guarding the retreat and a place just outside of the little village called Fallen Timbers. Uh, Forrest thought that the Union Army was getting too close. So he orders a charge because there are 50 Confederates on the rear guard and 3,000 Union soldiers. Nobody follows him. So Forrest attacks the Union Army by himself, gets into the middle of it, realizes what's happening. So he starts cutting and slashing his way to turn back around. Somebody puts a rifle on his hip and fires point blank. He keeps cutting and slashing, picks up a Union soldier by the neck, puts him behind the saddle to use as a shield and rides back to, <laughs> to the Confederate lines. And so there's no foot. So Dr. Humor obviously followed it up and thought, mm, I didn't because there's no foot. He didn't tell you where it came from, but he says, that it's accurate, so. I mean, I think he thought it was accurate. <laughs> it's a cool story. Do your students now revere this stuff or are they woke and it's not? Well, it's not that, I just don't think anybody reads. Uh, I think they, I think everybody looks at social media. I see. <laughs> it, that's a lot of reading yeah. to do. But yeah, I think once you tell the stories, people will get very interested. Did Foot ever comment on the lost cause phenomenon? Mm hmm He was mostly, he, one of the things he said to the Klan was, 
that got him in trouble in 1964 was that you people, he kept calling him scum, which was, probably didn't help, but he said you people are the antithesis of the spirit of Jefferson Davis because all Davis wanted was to get in front of the courts. He thought secession was legal. He wanted to get in front of the courts. When Mississippi seceded, he stayed in Washington hoping they'd arrest him. He wanted to get in front of the courts. He says, your people, all you do is you're, you're defying court decisions. Like that's the against the spirit of the Confederacy. So he said something, when people would ask him about this from time to time, he would say, which is, pause, another interesting thing. Once he finished this, he wanted to be done with the Civil War. And obviously no one ever let him be. And that three hour interview on East Parkway, the first hour, it's just the interview of Brian Lamb and Foot, and they're talking about Proust and Browning and Keats and all this business. And then they open it up to phone calls and every single phone call is, my great grandfather was blah, and Foot is always very gracious and he answers the question and, 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 uh, and that kind of thing. But when people asked about it, he would say something like, uh, there was nobility in what the Confederacy did, and there was a horrible injustice in what the Confederacy did. And mostly in the 20th century, people who uh, revere the Confederacy are overlooking the horrible injustice. Every now and then he would say, use a metaphor about the lost cause, he would say that Confederate symbols had been scrawled over in graffiti like the bathroom of a uh, men's bathroom at a roadhouse. <laughs> so it was like, he didn't think that judging people was the most important thing. He thought that understanding them was. But I think he would have a mixed, um, a mixed view of the lost cause. I think we have time for about one or two more questions. Perfect, thank you. <laughs>